Luke chapter 19. Thank you, Len. And um, jump down to verse 28. Let me read and then we'll talk. And I'll talk about the text by way of what it's saying in its exegetical context. And then we'll talk about some applications that we can take away from here to be who God would have us to be. Verse 29 says, verse 28 says, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up into Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, you will say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. Come on, say the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way into the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones or the rocks would cry out. Isn't that something? Yeah, if they were silent, the rocks. I don't know about you, but I want no rocks crying in my place. Amen. Not in my place. I want to... Give God the glory. This story, this story that's in front of us, um, we know it as the triumphant, triumphant entry, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to finalize his last days. But what we need to know about the last few days, especially Luke's rendition of this particular narrative, Luke begins in chapter 19 by doing two brief stories that serves as pretext to lay the foundation. If you read carefully what verses 28 to 40 is saying, you'd be able to get it. Luke opens up by talking about this young man by the name of Zacchaeus, who the text says was very wealthy and had a lot of money and was a tax collector, had done some things, and he heard that Jesus was coming his way. And wanting to see Jesus, the text says in that past first few verses of Luke, he went up in the street to encounter Jesus when Jesus came next to him. Interestingly enough, where Jesus got where he was, Jesus looked up in the tree and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down because today I'm going to go to your home. Well, needless to say, the scribes and Pharisees were unappreciative of Jesus hanging out with publicans and sinners, and they couldn't barely get Jesus to hang out with them. And Zacchaeus kind of makes this commitment to God within the confines of the story. And what I love about the way the story goes, laying foundation for where we're going, Jesus says in verse uh, Luke 19 and 10 that the Son of Man did not come, and I'm paraphrasing, for the rich or the well, or those who are not sick, or those who are not in need of a Savior. But it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, what I like about that, and I wish I had an amen right there, because that's talking about me. Come on, y'all. And I think it's talking about you. Um, imperfect people that need a Savior to save them. Isn't that good news? He says pointedly that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Subsequent to that particular parable story, he goes on, he talks about this rich man who all had a lot of money. And then here's what he says in that, and read that when you go home in the pretext. He was going away to be anointed king. Isn't that striking? Going away to be anointed king. And he talks about how the subjects did not want him to become king. Because if you follow Jesus' death, if you walk this thing all the way out, and I wish we had a week of services to teach the whole thing, you remember that was a prelude into people saying, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Because they didn't want him to become king. He gives his resources to his subjects and tell them to do, tells them to do well with it. 
The story picks up. He comes back. Some had done well, and they were rewarded. Some did not do so well, and they were not rewarded. But what Jesus was really doing, he was laying foundation for what was about to happen to him. And the sad commentary is people who were close with him missed what he was really saying to them. So then that story picks up, and then this one, our text for today in, in verse 28, begins to, to take its place, and I'm going to unfold it in a little while. But what you need to know about Luke chapter four, uh, 19, around verse 28, that story is, is written almost as a fulfillment of prophecy from Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14. Here's what Zechariah said. He prophesied that Jesus would come, or the Messiah would come, but here's what Zachy said. He says, when the Messiah comes, that, that he would deliver his people from their enemies, and he would overturn nations, and he would set them up. So with that type of a prophecy and that type of a prophetic utterance, the Jews had this framework that when Jesus came, he would set up his kingdom, and they would be in world dominance all over again. But does anybody in here know that Jesus is not concerned about world dominance? Come on, does anybody know that? That, that he says in, in Luke, I come to seek and to save that which was lost. So my goal and my focus is not this earth because I am from another place. So he had other business to do. So when it speaks of the triumphal entry, most Jews and most of us, when we hear triumphant entry, we visualize a king or a victor or a conquest. Someone who had just conquered many armies. And the norm was you entered the city riding on a horse while people are celebrating all the victory you have won. But I thank God that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was not about him delivering solely the Jewish people. He came for the world. Amen. Come on, isn't that good news? Amen. I thank God because that means I fit in. You ought to say amen for you because that means you fit in. Are you with me? So the triumphal entry, Jesus' entry, is not about a nation establishing world dominance or being back in position of prominence. It's about him laying the foundation for what was about to happen on Calvary. So unlike normal kings who came in glory and who came in prominence and who came showing off what they won and people calling their name and celebrating them, Jesus takes a different posture in that he comes in humility. And if you look at the text, I want to walk through the text because there's some applications that I want to draw out of this on the back end. So let me walk through this. It says here now, after he said, my purpose is to seek and to save the lost, and then when I come to do that, I'm going to be doing it in the form of a king, here's how the text opens up. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and next, verse 29 says, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into a village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt that is tied. Now, the importance of the colt being tied as it relates to the text, and, and let me read the next phrase I'm going to talk about, on which it says, no one has ever sat. Okay, the importance of that detail that Luke gives us is this. Kings were the only ones scheduled to ride on their horses. As a king, as a person of power, I did not share my horse with you. I did not share my animal, animal with you. It was reserved solely for the king. So if I may go here, when a horse was broken in, it wasn't given to the normal peasants or the locals to ride. It was reserved for the king. Here's what Jesus says. I am coming as a king. But I'm not coming as a secular king. I am coming in humility. I am coming to serve, so he says, but he still maintains that kingly theme of being the only one to ride on an animal. So go into town, and you're going to find a colt that has not yet been ridden. I hope you're seeing this, right? Because that's reserved for me as I'm coming in my kingly rule. Then he makes this statement, when you see it, untie it, and bring it to me. I'm going to come back and talk about that. And, and don't miss the prophecy. I, if anyone asks you, why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it. Oh, come on, y'all just say the Lord need it. Come on, say it again. Just say the Lord need it, okay? So, so in other words, when you go, I'm going to tell you 
that when you start to do my business, Lord have mercy, folks going to want to know why you're doing what you're doing. And you just got to say it's not about you, it's what God wants done. The Lord needs it. Come on, y'all. The Lord needs it. And so notice what the text says. It says in verse 32, um, so those who went away, they found it just as he had said, and as they were untying the colt, sure enough, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, look at this, the Lord needs it. And so they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set him on it. And as he rode along, notice what they did. They spread their cloaks on the ground. And as he was drawing near, already on his way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praising God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And I'll talk about that. Now understand with me, until this time, notice with me, whenever Jesus performed a miracle, there was always almost a sense of hush-hush about the miracle that he performed. And here's what he would say, my time is not yet. Don't let anyone know who I was. And, and so what's striking about that is wherever Jesus was, be it Galilee, be it Judea, be it Palestine, be it Samaria, be it the Gadarenes, be it the surrounding region of Jerusalem, he would perform all these miracles. Why? Because a prophet is not known in his own territory. So I am willing to bet that these disciples, that the text says, were praising him for what he did, probably thought he was going to Jerusalem to run a healing crusade. They had no idea why Jesus was going. So they're celebrating. They're not celebrating the fact that he's going as king or that he's going to go to the cross of Calvary. They're celebrating the miraculous works that he had done. They're celebrating the healing. They're celebrating the feeding of the 5,000. They're celebrating the fact that this Jesus was a great Jesus, and they're excited about that, and they're calling his name. And then look at this. I don't even know they realized what they were saying. It says here in verse 38, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory to God in the highest. The reason I like that, and I want to point this out briefly, whether they realize it or not, that Greek word anama, which, which is the word for name, here's what they're saying. If you know anything about biblical theology and biblical framework, name usually refers to character. Come on, y'all. So he, here's what they're saying. Blessed is the one who is coming in the character of God. They, 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 know what, they know what they were saying. Blessed is the one who's coming, and he's been behaving like God the whole time. Come on, y'all. Blessed is the one who is coming. Come on. God incarnated in man. If you had any biblical memory in your mind, you remember Jesus when, when the angel came to Mary, he says, you shall call his name Emmanuel. Come on. In man is El or God in man because God's coming to reside with us. And then here's the, blessed is he who's coming. And they're celebrating the fact that God has finally made it and didn't even realize what they were doing. And not only is he coming as God, but look at what this says. He's bringing heaven's peace on earth. Bringing heaven's peace on earth. This is critical. This is critical because for a long time, these Jewish people were subject to Roman governance and Roman empire. And they were subject to not being the people they felt God created them to be. And so they're saying God is coming. And they're making a ruckus. And they're making a big deal about this. Hosanna, here he comes in the name of the Lord. And they're, they're, they're celebrating him as if sure enough, he is king of kings and lord of lords. And they're making noise in those streets. And watch the church, folk. 39, some of the deacons and elders, we have deacons now, so I can say deacons, yeah. yeah. Some of the ministers and the church people in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Shut them up. <laughs> Shut them up, they said. And listen to Jesus' response. I tell you, if these were silent, my words... God would use whatever he needs to use to declare my presence. Come on, are you with me? So he says, if, if, if you shut them up, guess what you're not going to do? Shut up the earth. 
<laughs> I wish I had somebody in here. Because understand with me, I'm not going to Jerusalem just to heal the sick and to raise the dead. That was cute, and that was my ministry, or that was a byproduct of my journey to Calvary. Are you with me? But listen, and so when I heal the sick, I'd stay quiet because I haven't started the road to Jerusalem. When I'd raise the dead, I'd stay quiet. When I'd feed the hungry, I'd say, keep that under your hat because I haven't started to live out my true destiny and my true purpose. But when comes time for the Father to tell the world who I am, I wish I had somebody in here. Nobody can keep me quiet because God himself is going to declare who I am because my time is yet. So listen, even if I tell them shut up, you want me to tell the birds to shut up? You want me to tell the animals to shut up? You Come on, y'all not hearing me. If, if they hold their peace, the earth is going to bust open because of who I am. So he's going, he said, he said, listen, listen, we can't, we can't, they can't help it. They can't help it because my true purpose, my true destiny is being realized and I'm getting to the place where I am doing what it is that God has called me and God has purposed me to do. Now, now, let me go here, let me go here. Um, I need you to know that this story on the surface, it's good information, it's good data. And somebody might be saying, okay, preacher, that's good, but what does that have to do with me today? How does this connect with me today that Jesus entered into Jerusalem bringing peace, going to that cross to die? What's that all about? Here's what I want you to hear me say as we kind of walk through this briefly. I believe that this text has relevance and significance for today because just like Jesus and like these disciples, we ought to praise God for what he has done. Are you with me? Because now we, or you and I, like Jesus, have an obligation to enter the Jerusalems of our life. I wish I had somebody to do what Jesus did. Does that make sense? Uh, let's, let's walk this out. Let's walk this out. There's a couple of things I want you to see in the text. And the first would do this. I want you to take this away as a thought. And here's, like these disciples, Jesus deserves a praise for two things. For who he is. And for what he has done. We're going to show you in the text. Repeat after me. Say, self. Jesus deserved the praise for who he is and what he has done for me. One more time. Say, self. Jesus deserves the praise for who he is and for what he has done for me. Three things. Okay, here's the first real quick. Number one. He deserves the praise for what he has done for me, okay? I don't know about none of y'all up in here, up in here. I know what he did for me. I think by virtue of the fact that you're breathing and you're alive in this place, you too, like me, can say he deserved the praise for what he did for you. Are you with me? I just need a couple of amens. Come on, y'all. Somebody, 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 somebody in here. Ought to say he deserved the praise for what he did. Well, preacher, what did he do, right? You're asking, well, what, what did he do? Let's walk this out. I'm going to show you what he did for you. So let's read the text. He did several things, okay? Number one, I'm going to say 2A, he loosed us from the grips of sin. Okay, yeah. Come on, y'all. You, you didn't lose yourself. Come on, y'all. Your mama didn't lose you. You might have got out after doing four to five, but the judge didn't lose you. Yeah, yeah. God, God, are you with me? So, so before I even read in the text, understand with me that by way of application, if you were to read Luke chapter 4, here's what Jesus would say in Luke chapter 4 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord was upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, right? He has sent me to set at liberty those that are bound. He has sent me to open up blinded eyes. And he said this, he had also sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Why are you saying all that, preacher? I'm saying that to set up point number one, that Jesus is in the loosen business. Come on, y'all. He, he's in the lucid business. So when you look at the text, look at the text by way of application, and just go here with me. Verse 28 says, when he had said these things, he sent his people ahead um, going into Jerusalem. And when they drew near to Bethpage and Bethany on the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you. And on entering, he says, you will find a colt that is tied. You will find a colt 
that is tied, okay? Then he goes ahead and he says this, untie it. Uh, and this thing is because no one has ever sat on it, untie it, and bring it to me, right? Let me go ahead of myself. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it, okay? So let's, let's flesh this out for a little while because I believe Jesus is in the untying business. Understand with me that Jesus is God. He didn't need a colt to get into Jerusalem. Come on, come on. Yeah, he, he didn't have to function just the way earthly kings did. Are you with me? So the only purpose this cult served, in addition to being the symbol of a king entering Jerusalem, not in arrogance or prominence, but in humility and sovereignty, the cult then represented or symbolized the vehicle of transportation. Are you with me? So here's the thing with this vehicle of transportation. The only purpose the, the cult served was to show Jesus as king, but it was the thing that transported him from Olivet all the way into Jerusalem. Are you with me? So it was the vehicle of transportation. He rode on that thing to get where he was going. The problem with the text, though, however, is before he can use the cult, he had to announce the fact that it was tied up. Come on, it had never been used and it had been tied up. So before he can get to using the thing, the first thing he had to do was send someone to untie it. Y'all, let me tell you the reason I like that. Because like that cult, huh? like that cult, before Jesus was able to use me, I found myself in a posture of ineffectiveness. I found a pro- myself in a posture of being bound, a posture of being in slavery, a posture of being in bondage. Come on, I was bound. Come on, I needed somebody to tell me about the love of God so like that thing, I too can be loosed. Are you with me? Because God wanted to use me, but I found myself tied up. Don't act like you ain't been tied up. Don't act like you loosen yourself. The only reason I'm free is because somebody had to come and tell me about the love of God to set me free. The only reason you're free is because somebody had to come and tell you about the love of God to set you free. So Jesus wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem. So he sends people ahead. You're going to find a colt. And then listen to the prophecy. When they ask you why you're on tired, here's what you say. Because I knew them before the foundation of the world. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Before the foundation of the world, I ordained them to be a prophet, to be a preacher, to be, come on, you, you, pick your, you pick whatever God has you. I created you for greater than you are. And the fact that you are bound up, you are ineffective. So the reason I need you loose is because I have purpose and I have destiny for you. <sighs> don't think, don't think, don't think like the Israelites on their exodus from Egypt. That God just set you free for the mere pleasure of setting you free. I say this all the time, I'm going to say it again. There's divine intention attached to your liberation. He set you free so you can be used by him. This is a plug for those of you that ain't connected to ministry yet. So if you ain't doing nothing, you're just a wild coat untied not being used by Jesus. Time to get connected. Are you, help me, I'll turn your neighbor and say, neighbor. Is Jesus using you? Very, very important. Very, very important, right? So lock into this. He loosed us, number one, from the grips. Number two, he set us free so he can use us. And then here's how to use this. Number three, he entered our life. Because when you read the text, they brought the coat to Jesus. They put their coat on it. And I love this because it says Jesus then got on the coat and he rode the thing to Jerusalem. Are you with me? Y'all, y'all, in case you're missing this, here's what happens when I got set free. He, he entered my life by means of the Holy Spirit. Are you getting this? And the Spirit enters me, and now that the Spirit is in me, listen to what I've become. I have become the vehicle of transportation to get Jesus to the Jerusalems of this world. I hope, are y'all getting this? Come on, are you getting this? 
So, so in your neighborhood, here, here's what he says in Matthew, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world. That means what? If Jesus is not in your home, you have not availed yourself for him to enter you and ride you into your home. Come on. If Jesus is not on your job, it's because you have not allowed him to enter you and ride you into your job. If Jesus is not in your school is because you have not allowed him to untie you and enter you and ride you into the school. If he's not with you in the places where you shop, it's because you're still in bondage and you not allowed him to untie you and enter you and ride you into the schools. If Jerusalem, our neighborhoods, our homes, our marriages have not yet experienced Jesus, don't blame God. Check who's riding the colt. Are you hearing me? Check who's riding the colt. Don't talk about Satan had me bound. Jesus set me free. And you ain't doing nothing. The world needs peace. They need a gospel of peace. They need a message of peace. And just like Jesus realizing his purpose, this triumphal entry, here is what Easter week ought to look like. A bunch of Jesuses going all over the world bringing peace. Come on, does this make sense? Are you with me? And then we celebrate God. We praise God. We bless him, number D, in spite of us. Here, look at this text. Look at this text. I like this. Let, let me read this. And I really don't have time to do with this. It says here, it says, then the whole multitude, verse 38, as he rode along, they spread their clothes on the ground. And as he was drawing near, 37, already on his way down the Mount of Baha'u'llah, to the whole multitude of his disciples, the whole multitude of his disciples, the whole multitude of his disciples. What I like about that, it wasn't the street folk praising him. It wasn't people that didn't yet know him praising him. It was those that were followers of Jesus, his disciples. It doesn't even say the scribes and the Pharisees were praising him because they didn't know him like that. Are you with me? It was the people that was around that mule as he was riding the mule. They were praising him. And look at what they were doing for all the mighty works that he had, they had seen him do. Now, this is where I'm going. I, say this, I said this this morning. I'm going to say it again. You don't have a heaven or hell to put me in. You didn't heal me from nothing. You didn't deliver me from nothing. You didn't save me from nothing. Come on. You didn't give me nothing. It was God who did it. So if anyone has a reason to praise God, it's a person who used to be bound. A person who has been set free. A person who now, the presence of God indwells. A person who has been commissioned and charged with the responsibility to bring peace to the Jerusalems of this world. Text says they praise him, they praise him, they praise him. All right? I mean, thank you for no reason. Folks sitting at their computer station at work, thank you. Because <laughs> they remembered how bound they were and how it was nobody but God. Ah, oh, Jesus, I need a witness right there. Nobody but God. Nobody but God. And, and so lock into this. You lock into this. Can you imagine the world trying to shut the church up? They're, they're trying. Oh, they're trying. They're trying. Taking prayers out of schools. Taking prayers out of this, prayers out of that. They're trying. They're trying. But does anybody know you can't shut? Come on, y'all. You, you can't. You can't. You can't. Come on, you cannot. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word is going to stand firm, right? So then, so then, look at the thing. Not only, not only do we praise God for who he is, for what he's done, but we praise him because of who he is, right? Remember I said with you, remember I said with you that they said, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord, bringing peace from heaven. Here's, here, here's why I praise Jesus and I praise God for who Jesus is and what he's done for me. Inside of me dwells all the God I will ever need. He incarnated himself in the flesh. Philippians 2, right? Being in the form of God did not, 
consider equality with God something to be grasped, made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a servant, being found of a servant, he humbled himself and died, even the death of the cross. He goes back to be with his father, and his father sends the son in the form of the spirit to live in me. In me, this trips me out. In me is God himself. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> My wife don't do this often, but she does it every now and then. She don't do it often. When she gets mad with me, she'll call me a name that's not my own. Husbands, come on, y'all had that experience. Come on, fellas, help, help a brother out. Yeah, y'all had that experience. Yeah, y'all had that, yeah. When they get mad, they call you something that's not your, your own name. And then sometimes you look at me and hear, who are you talking to? And the reason you have that attitude, especially if you're a child of God, is because you know what she sees is not who you really are. <laughs> And she's just speaking to the flesh, right? On the inside, you're packaged with power. Packaged with God. Come on, are you hearing me? And on the inside of you, in the inside of me, is the presence and the very spirit of God. If that is not enough to praise God, I don't know what is. Come on, I don't know what is. That God is in you. And here, here, here's the beauty, here's the beauty of, of all of that and what that's really saying, if we can get that back up. Because here's the thing, what it's, it's saying now is that don't allow, don't allow, here's a phrase I use, your geology to impact your theology. Let me tell you what I mean by that. What I mean by that. When I get a revelation that God is on the inside, there is nothing you could do on the face of the earth to have me shut my mouth such that a rock has to give God praise for me. Come on, is this making sense? Are you hearing me? Jesus did not go to Calvary for a rock. Come on. He didn't go to Calvary for the birds. Come on. He didn't go to Calvary for the animals. Come on. He didn't go to Calvary for the plant life because none of them were made in his image. So if anybody has a study or a theology of God, it ought to be me that I praise him for who he is and I praise him for what he does. And there is nothing that ought to happen that will cause me to shut my mouth such that God has to say to me, if you don't praise me, I'm going to use the rock because I will get my praise. Yeah. He will. And because of who he is, because of what he did, I think we ought to praise the Lord. Are you hearing me? I mean, come on, the fact that, 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 that I was bound and he untied me, and he loosed me, and he filled me with his spirit, and he empowered me with his Holy Spirit, and now he wants to use me as the vehicle of transportation to spread his love into the world, bringing peace to the world. I am humbled, and I am honored, and you ought to be humble, and you ought to be honored that God would do that with us. So here's my response, right? Lord, I'm going to praise you, and not only that, but I'm going to avail myself to be used by you. Does that make sense? So if I'm you, come on team, and, and, and I'm here and I'm hearing this, I'm like, gosh, Lord, forgive me. And if I haven't said yes to him, I'm saying, Lord, come into my life and save me. Lord, come, thank you for what you did. And if I'm here and I'm bound... And, and you're saying to me, preacher, that God can untie me? Yeah. That God can use me? Yeah. So here's what that means. If you're here and you're going through some stronghold, some bondage situation, something that can't break free from, this is what this triumphant entry is all about. God coming to set me free and God coming to set you free. So here's what I want you to do. Stand to your feet with me just for a while. Just stand to your feet. And we're going to take a moment just to pray and just to worship God and thank God for who he is and for what he's done and how he's moved. And I want to say to you, if you're hearing this and you haven't said yes to God, the Bible still says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you're like me and this word convicts you, there comes a place where we say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, let me give myself to you all over again and allow God to be God. So while we take a time moment just in ministry, 
I want to give you a chance just to bow your heads and just say, Lord, move. Lord, have your way. Lord, forgive. Lord, Lord, just, just allow him. As we go into this holy week, he's a great God.